Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me well? Okay, thank you guys. So uh, as usual, today we're gonna have a quiz, the first 15 minutes, and that will start at 11.10. Uh, so after the quiz, that should be, you should be done with it around 11.25. We will continue with there, uh, some examples for the problems uh, based on today's and previous lecture material. Any questions? Okay. Okay, the question from Jonathan. Did you just said the quiz is about previous lecture material or this week? So as I said in the lecture and from previous request, the quiz is mostly on the previous lecture uh, material, not this uh, last week lecture. But there can be some questions from this week just because there is a small gap. Uh, so essentially you're gonna get a lot of questions about flip-flops and things like that. So you didn't miss any, uh, Quintan, you didn't miss anything serious. I just said when we're going to have the quiz, right? So which is going to be at 11.10. It will be open for you and you should be done in 15 minutes as usual. And there, and essentially the material is mostly from last week, right? On flip-flops and everything. And a, little, a few questions maybe from uh, Wednesday lectures, but not a lot.
Okay, I think it's 11.10, so uh, you should be able to start the quiz now. Good luck, and please let me know if you had any technical issues so we can fix it immediately. Good luck, guys, and see you in 15 minutes.
Okay, guys, I hope everyone is done with the test by now. And uh, I think you guys did overall quite well. I think there at the time I checked just before I start talking to you now, it was around 73% average. So I think most questions will handle well, although the questions were harder, although we reduced the number of questions, but I think most of you got it well. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this week's material now. And uh, so week five right now, right before the week, uh, just before the break. So uh, we learned on Wednesday about counters, registers, and finite state machines. And the latter has been the most complicated part of the material, obviously, and big and fundamental about how to build sequential circuits. So let's look at a couple of questions that I prepared for you uh, related to them and see how you can handle them. It's again, it's assumed that at least you watch or attended the lecture. Uh, so in this first questions, imagine you have access to a four bit registers and it's defined and uh, this diagram here. So we are using as an input a right signal. So questions to you guys, what does right signal do for the register? Like what's the meaning and how it's utilized? So anyone want to type your answer? Yeah, so like all these answers are uh, reasonably correct. So essentially what write signal does, it lets these inputs D0, D1, D2, D3 actually being updated properly. Otherwise uh, the register would just keep the old value, right? So it enables writing the data through the hardware logic, uh, through the logic uh, that we show in the class through this corresponding end logic. So when write is one, then it's the only time where you actually write a new value into the registers. That's correct. Okay, so uh, a little bit more complicated questions. Again, assume that you have access to, a, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, guys, if any, at least some of you can turn on your video, as usually that would be very helpful. So if, uh, if you can do this safely, please do so. Hopefully at least some of you will. Okay. So second questions. Uh, second questions. Assume you have access to a counter circuit that has clock, enabler, and the clear, right? Uh, how do you make a signal that goes high after 10 clock cycles? So I want, uh, so if you want, you can type, or if you want, you can raise hand and I will mute you or you unmute yourself and try to give an answer. Can anyone give it a try to answer the first questions? How to make something happens, uh, how to get a signal that the clock, uh, the counter is 10 essentially. Yeah, Jefferson uh, gave an answer and that's, uh, let me see, is this the correct answer or not? The idea is, right, but the implementation you would need, I think you made a mistake, Jefferson, in your formula. Like Q0 is the first, yes, yes. But the idea was correct, we just make a mistake. Yeah. We just need to switch to three to two. But otherwise that's correct. So yeah, I will explain it. I just want people to think a little bit before I give confirm that. And uh, so essentially uh, the counter, remember when we define it, it counts everything in somewhat of a binary form. So essentially each bit is behaves similar as a position 
as a binary number. So essentially Q0 is response to two power zero, coefficient in front of two power zero. This is two power one, this is two power two, this is two power three. So essentially, uh, so, so the, uh, if you want to get 10, what you really want, you want to get one, zero, one, zero, right? That's the, the binary representation for 10. So essentially, you would want to have uh, Q3 being true and you want Q2 to be true, or Q1, sorry, Q3 and Q1, and the other two being negated. And then you add that and that's your counter. And uh, so essentially, if you, uh, like what the idea to do that every tense, uh, like if I want to take so, uh, Jan, did you get the answer? For well, anyone who wasn't, yeah. So it's essentially you just add the, the right bits, right? Uh, so that represent the counter, right? Because the, each of them counts the, the portion of the binary representation of a number, essentially. So you just need to take this flex and add. Okay, a slight modification to this question is, what if I want to make the signal goes high every 10 cycles? So what would you need to do extra? So we already were able to do a signal high when it's the first 10 cycles, but how to make it a repeated thing? What would you do? You can type the text if you want this relatively simple modification. Yeah, I think so essentially, I, I see the, the question, uh, uh, two answers. They're both correct, which is the level of precision is slightly different, but the, the key idea is there, right? Essentially, these, after we form the output here, we checked whether it's 10 or not, right? And we get from that signal, we get uh, either yes or no, high or low. So what we do this, <coughs> we essentially go and feed that into the clear through another uh, ant and then essentially when this output for 10 is true, uh, then uh, we make it clear, right? And then the clear signal uh, essentially enabled, right? And make everything zeros again, and then it keeps incrementing. So yes, that's the basic idea. I hope everyone got it. If you are confused how that would work, please ask now. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I assume people got it. So let's go for slightly more complicated questions. Uh, uh, you can think about it. I'm not gonna give the answer right now. How would you make a signal that goes high every hundred cycles only using bit, four bit counters like the one below and a few additional gates? Okay. Any questions here? So to answer Farhan's questions, in order to get n, so for the previous questions, in order to get 10 to begin with, you just uh, you just keep counting and then you just figure out when the count is equal to 10, you just do a corresponding n logic. And to repeat the process, you just need to feed the output of that, you know, Q3, not Q2, Q1, not Q0 with an end, uh, yeah, back uh, to clear. And, Yuzhan sends, Yuzhan, uh, are you trying to answer their follow-up question for two, right? How to do 100? Uh, yeah, the, the key idea is the same. So you essentially, you let it count to like 16, then you, you just get, you just get multiple of those count to 16, and then you do an end, right, across them. Uh, yeah, you can do 10, 10 times, right? Or uh, if you just use uh, four bit counters like this, you can uh, use fewer, just count to 16, right? Okay, well, let's move on. So this is something for you to, to, to experiment. Uh, essentially there are multiple different uh, ways to do it. So you can, uh, 
you can do, you know, uh, count to 10 and just repeat it, or you can count to 16 and just record when that's done. Oh yeah, there are a lot of other good ideas. Yeah, there are many ways to do it. You're right. So you can hit it to another counter and count that uh, every time that goes. So you can, you know, that's another option. There are many different ways. Okay, so you can think about it offline. Let's go and try to uh, revise some material related to finite state machines. Remember in the finite, uh, finite state machines, uh, there are states and transi transitions. So yeah, the questions here, how many flip-flops you would need to implement the following finite state machines, right? Uh, uh, so everyone probably already counted the number of states here, right? So there are 11 states here. So this is the math, right? The number of flip slots is the log ceiling of the log of the number of states. And as everyone who tried to answer already answered, the right answer is four here. So this is how many flip flops you would need to implement, uh, to use. Not all states of these flip flops would be needed. So you're gonna get some, you know, spare states or undefined states that you can define the way you want, but that's how many flip flops you need to implement at least. Okay. So a more complicated questions, so we now go in details. Uh, how would we make the following finite state machines from James Bond movie? So a so-called exploding pen, right? How would you implement that? Well, uh, essentially pen starts off in disarm state. That's how you normally use it. When click three times, pen arms itself, right? When click three more times, pen disarmed itself. So something for you to think of what would be the steps to make such a circuit, right? This is, you can try to do it home. I'll show you another similar problem. So this is to try you at home. You're gonna get slides so you can try it out. Just a reminder, so how we handle problems like that. You draw a state diagram, you derive a state table from the state diagram and we're gonna practice this now in the time left. Then we assign flip-flop configurations to each state. And remember the minimum number of flip-flops needed is ceiling of log number of states, log two number of states. Then you redraw the state table with flip-flop values and derive combinatorial circuit for output for each flip-flop count. So this is the five major steps we need to do. It's a you know tedious process, but that's the way to generate the actual circuit for it. Okay, so essentially, uh, step five requires two combinatorial circuit design tasks. And uh, for more machines, uh, we uh, essentially uh, focus solely on the output on the current states, so flip-flop values. And for simplicity, uh, um, today I'm going to only talk about Moore's machine, right? But there's also Milius machine, remember? Uh, because for Milius machine, the output is determined by both the current state and the current input values that makes their implementation a little bit more complicated. So for simplicity, let's focus on Moore's machine only for now. So essentially uh, state diagrams with output. Output values are incorporated into the state diagram depending on the machine used. So this is uh, Moore's machine, right? You had inputs and states, right? And this is how the MIDI machines look like. That's the difference. Uh, okay, so let's, oh, something happened uh, with the slide. So let me try to fix it. I know it was fine yesterday, so something shifted. Let me just fix the slide quickly. Okay, so this is the example we are now uh, going to play with. So what this thing is doing, we are trying to implement a barcode reader. I guess everyone who went, you know, to the convenience stores seen those barcodes, right? So we're trying to implement an UPC barcodes with the laser scanner that looks for uh, black and white bars that indicate the start of the code. So the way it works, if 
the black is read as a one, right? And white is read as a zero, that's the conventions. Then the start of the code from either direction is a part in one, zero, one, zero. So essentially this is, you see one, zero, one, zero, and from both ends, this is how the laser worked, right? That's the start, right? And then essentially it's symmetrical. And then the rest of the code is written, right? So what we are asking you to do for, you know, as a simple exercise, and I will do it with you step by step, how we can create a state machine that detects this part. So essentially, if we have to build a circuit, right, to, to read the Spartans, how, uh, to read the Spartans, and right now we're only focusing on whether that's a valid Spartan, the start of it, how would I do it? So essentially we need, our goal is to detect one zero, one zero pattern. So anyone is clear on the problem? So what state machine we're trying to build? Anyone have any questions on the problem? Okay. Let's move on. So I'll help you with a uh, state diagram, right? Because it's a little bit complicated here, but you will understand it when I draw it. So we start with a state A, right? That represents that, you know, we didn't read anything yet. And then we start reading. And then in that state, if I keep reading, if I'm keeping reading, so if I see white, right? White means nothing changed. I can have an infinite white from the laser scanner. So it means I didn't read anything. So I keep staying in the same state eight. It means I didn't start the sequence. The minute I see the first one, right? It means I've seen the black. So I go to the next state B. It means I've seen black started. After that, if I keep seeing black, it, it does mean that it might be the same stripe or another stripe, it doesn't really matter. It means it just keep being black. I don't really change anything. I keep staying in the stage, meaning I see one, I see black, I see black, I see black. Then if I actually see follow up zero, it means I've seen black followed by a white. And that brings me to the state C, I see in black and white. If out of a sudden, uh, essentially, I keep sitting, uh, seeing white again, it means that the pattern was broken, right? So I, ha I had one, zero, zero, and I need to start from the beginning. I go to the white again. It means that was not a proper start. Then if I, if contrary to that, I'm in state C, and I see another one, it means I've seen black, white, black. Well, the thing is white is like, uh, at the beginning white can be a color of the background, right? So there's no reason to move until you see the first black. But there is like, you can assume that essentially you're, when you go from one to zero, you're not reading a garbage anymore, right? You're not reading something on the side. You've seen black, uh, then you see zero, right? So there is no reason when you see the first, uh, when you're in state B, there is no reason to switch. If you see another one to start from scratch because you're still seeing one, you're still always can treat any one as the beginning of a sequence, right? So there's no reason to, you know, uh, to refresh anything. So Terry, does it answer your question? Essentially, if you am here, if I see another one, you can forget about the previous one. I still at the beginning of their proper sequence. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the interesting part. So when I see essentially zero zero here, there's nothing interesting. I cannot really start uh, the sequence. It can be just the background on the side, or it might be just, you know, too long of a zero. But anyway, nothing interesting happens until I see the first one. And then what I really want to get is one, zero, one. So this is the sequence I go with states. And again, if I ended up getting one, zero, and another zero, I start from scratch. It means that the sequence was broken. Okay. And then if I get uh, essentially one, zero, one, and then I get another one, right? It means that the sequence is broken because I get one, zero, one, one instead of one, zero, one, zero. 
but that brings me to state B, not from the beginning, because it means that this one can be a start of a new proper sequence, right? So I go back to state B, not all the way to A. And if I was lucky and I get one, zero, one, zero, this is the state I really want to be. So that's the, the truth value I need to report. And then if I see after this one, zero, one, zero, uh, if I see one again, it brings me to their state D. Why state D? Because I had one, zero, one. So that part of the sequence can be interpreted also as a part of the next one, zero, one, zero. So I only go back to state D, not all the way back. But if I had the real zero here, right, uh, to get one, zero, one, zero, and you get another zero, it means you're starting all the way from scratch. Okay, any questions here? Is this clear how I draw the state diagram? Yeah, I mean, there, just to be honest, uh, state diagram is the most complicated task, right? That's how you put the real life problem into mathematical representation, right? Uh, um, and that's why state machines are used for simpler problems, but not everywhere. Like you could have, if you know the theory behind finding state machines, all your programming with all the programming languages can be done with FSMs, but it's just practically complicated. So we don't use it in most cases, but for some simple things we do use it. And this problem considered to be uh, simple. Okay, any other questions? This is why I said I didn't ask you to try to come up with yourself. I show you the solution step-by-step, step, how I devise it. Okay. So after that, things are getting more straightforward. So in state, uh, step two, we need to build a state table having this diagram here. So essentially output Z is determined by the current state. So we're focusing on the Moore machine, remember? And uh, after that, we'll allocate the flip-flops and all of that, right? So remember, we had five states here, A, B, C, D, E. So this is the, the state table. And essentially, it represents how I transition from different states based on the input. And it's really easy to build it. I hope it won't be complicated. <coughs> Sorry, guys, to anyone. So if you look here, at the beginning, it was a state A. If I, my input is X, I keep, uh, I keep staying in state A and the output is zero because I didn't match the sequence. And the rest is just boringly reflecting this diagram into this table. So if X is one, then the only thing I do, I transition into B, but the output is still zero. I did, didn't uh, detect the sequence. And so B is the same, I just transition. Uh, this thing is again, is transition. The interesting st uh, things uh, starts to happen when I reach the, uh, uh, the state E because the state E means I had the sequence one zero one zero. So because it's one zero one zero when we reach the state E, no matter what the input is, the output is always correct. We just matched one zero one zero, right? But the difference is in which state we go. If we happen to get zero, then we need to start from the beginning to look for a new sequence one zero one zero and go in here. While if I, I happen to get another one, it just brings me uh, you know, to the D state because I'm essentially seeing a sequence one zero one, right? Does it make sense? So that's essentially the state table that we got for this problem. Any questions here? I hope this part is straightforward. So this is your input. This is your current state. This is the next state. And this is your output. Okay. So the next step, remember step three for this problem, I need to do a flip-flop assignment. Uh, because we have five state, then I hope everyone learned by now, I need three flip-flops. Remember, flip-flops can be assigned differently. So there can be some assignments that are better than others. So a question to you, why this uh, assignment of different states to flip-flops, remember flip-flops, and you have three flip-flops, they can have 
you know, any combinations of three bits and I need to assign state to these combinations of bit. So question to you, why this assignment is a terrible idea? Anyone want to say why I don't like assignments like that? There's something covered in the lecture. Like there is a flexibility. Yes, yeah, so you want to differ by more than, uh, so they differ by more than one bit. Uh, and uh, remember when you differ, you can get different race conditions. Some are bad and some are not. But as uh, I think Krutik said, in here from A to B, three bits flipped, right? That's the worst possible situation, right? It's definitely going to lead to a problem, right? So this is a bad assignment. So not every two bit flips leads to the problems. You can be careful about that. Uh, so remember what you need to be careful is race conditions, right? When you go from state to state, right? From A to B here, one bit flip, from B to C, one bit flip. Here from C to D, you have, you see the two bit flips, right? Uh, so there is this place where this happens and from C to A, two bit flips. But the good thing here is that it's uh, race conditions that you want to avoid, but they are safer because they don't change the output behavior. So Farhan asks question, when are two bit flips are bad? So it's not just only about the number of bit flips, it's whether the output would change. So it's like one problem here is that couldn't you, depending on the order in which you would uh, flip bits here, the output would change. And the answer in this case, if you carefully look, the output won't change. So it doesn't matter in which order you're gonna flip a bit in the flip flops, the intermediate state you would get won't be a problem. Like for example, going from C to D, right? If for example, you go from C to D and the first uh, bit flips goes, uh, uh, flips is this one, 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 one. Like, so guys, focus with me. You see, we're going from C to D. So to go from C to D, I need to flip this bit and I need to flip second bit. So there can be two possibilities. If I flip this bit first, I get a state one, one, one. This state doesn't exist, right? So I can assign it to the value I want. I can assign it to zero, so nothing change, right? So uh, it is not a problem. And similarly here, so that, that's the, the good thing about it. So it's like whatever intermediate things I can get here. And then other options, if I got from here to here, I first flip the second bit. So I get zero, zero, 001. So I get to state B then kind of, right? But it doesn't really, again, the output of the B is still zero. So it doesn't really change anything, okay? So very good questions. How do we control which bit to flip first? The problem is we have no control over that. So we get a race condition. So we need to consider both possibility if the first bit flips or the second. Uh, so uh, so like, let me first answer the uh, genius question. So essentially when uh, two, uh, so what happens uh, which bit flips first. So the answer is we have no control is a race condition in a circuit. Each bit can flip uh, first. So we need to consider both cases. For example, here, it might be the first bit flips first when you go from C to D, or it can be this bit flip first. I need to consider both cases and see that it doesn't lead to wrong answer. So if here, for example, if the first bit flip first, I get to a state one, one, one that doesn't exist because it doesn't exist. I can assign it to anything I want. So I can assign it to zero. So there is no problem. <clears throat> and then because that matches what, what the circuit would generate even if the two bit flips simultaneously, right? Because when you go from C to D, the output is also zero. So Sam is asking the question, uh, uh, but also Terry has a question. Output of the B is still zero. Can you explain that? So when I was going from C to D and, and then I'll answer Sam's question. So when you had zero one one and go to one zero one and say the first bit flipping is this bit. So you get zero zero one, right? So you get into state B, right? The output of that when you go here is zero and it matches that we would get, right? So there's no problem. Okay, and same question was, so going to B when doing C to D is okay in this case because you already have one as your input. That's correct. 
So the main thing is like the way, uh, so it just temporarily would be in state B and then you're gonna flip another uh, bit, right? So uh, you will get zero, zero, 001 and then you get uh, essentially one, zero, 1, 0, 1 and get into state D and that's the state you're supposed to be, right? The main thing is in the on the way when you have these intermediate flips, you want to make sure you don't generate any wrong result. Is this clear, guys? I know it's not an easy material. So um, race conditions are a tricky problem. It's related to parallelism, one of the hardest problem in programming, right? So uh, this is why uh, ideally you really want to generate a circuit. We, we cannot cover that. There is a ways to prove. Uh, to get this guaranteed situation where we just had one bit flip. If there is just one bit flips, there is no race conditions. So usually people even say for race conditions, they're trying to avoid them if they can, okay? But there are mathematical ways to prove the absence of race conditions under certain constraints. So sometimes if you can do that, or you can essentially prove that every race condition is harmless then, but it's faster to have a circuits like that, right? then you can do it because you can also fix problems with adding more flip-flops to the problem, but that becomes more expensive. Okay, so what we're gonna do in the step four, we literally just uh, go and redraw the table with their, uh, you know, flip-flops we want to do, right? So essentially here, we literally have, uh, you know, assigned bits, remember, like in this graph, that's, what I selected as an assignment. Don't ask how, it's just like one way to do it. And it's one very simple way, right? I just go and increment everything by one. So it's not particularly difficult, but there are some difference. You see when I go zero, zero, 001, then I go one, one. I don't go all the way to one, zero, zero, right? That's a problem I show in the previous slides. I go into one or one because I had spare states available. Okay, so I try to minimize the number of bit flips. That's what I did here, but it's really straightforward solution. Then I just take that and literally just map it into this table. So this is uh, a straightforward way. After the states are defined, I can I can do this. Remember uh, when uh, those are only the states that are defined, right, by me, but there are a lot of other states that are not defined. So the next step here is going for kmap. Right? So we have inputs, which are X, that's our input. And we have three flip-flops, F0, F2, F1, as our inputs, right? And we try to generate, you know, state for them. Just trust me on properly generating this table. Ones are the real ones we had in the table, right? And for the output. And uh, uh, the other ones, X is undefined states. So the way I cover that is our traditional, you know, uh, K-map thing. So I cover this four, I cover this two, I cover this two, and this would be using K-maps is essentially the formula for output F2, right? That's the output F2. And we do this systematically for every output. We do it for F2, we do it for F1, so this is the uh, formula for F1 output, right, for the, so this is just to remind you how I'm doing it. You see, this is, you know, uh, uh, you have the center of zero, F1, F2, and this is the next state, which is the whole sort there, you know, the part of your flip-flops. So we had three ones, because this is three ones here, right, in, F, in F2, this is F1, and uh, the last one is F0. So this is F2, right, we just got it. This is F1, it has just one one, right? That's it. It's a very simple state, right? Very simple to compute. And then you have F0, it has a lot of ones in it, but they're also very easy to cover. You get that plus that. So you get just two terms add up here, X plus not F2, uh, not F1, not F0. Guys, do you understand that? That's a straightforward application of coronal maps, right? To to this table, right? This is essentially your F0, F1, F2 as input, and those are the same things, but as outputs. And you just, for each separate output, you write formulas, like separately. So we do it for F2 first, then we do it for F1, 
and we do it for F0, right? That's how we build combinatorial circuits. So we get those three pieces together. And after that, the only thing left is to build that that goes high based on the following output equations. And that's a relatively straightforward. Essentially, we just look at what the output should be, right? Based on what we built. And we essentially just look at the math here, right? And we just derive the equations. And here it's just F2, not F1, not F0. So this is a very long, complicated end-to-end -end examples going for like, we're not gonna get anything like that on the quiz, but you might get something like that on your final exams. So you get enough time to play with it, right? And you can see if you just follow the template at uh, each state, you're gonna see uh, things are you know relatively straightforward. The most complicated stuff, as someone noted, is to build this original state diagram, right? After you build the state diagram, that's the really the where the main challenge is. Okay. That's pretty much what I have for today. As usual, you will get the slides and the video after the class sometime today. Uh, and um, hopefully that would clarify you from very simple to the most complicated examples, the material from Wednesday's lecture. And uh, are there any questions right now left? So uh, next week is the reading week, right? So, uh, so there's no labs in the reading week. Like if I'm correct with the schedule, because in downtown and at UTC they had different schedule. I think in in Scarborough uh, they had a reading week next week. Okay, so there's no labs. So reading week it means there's no class and no labs. Okay, any other questions logistic world, logistic world? Yeah, uh, thank you guys again. Uh, and I wish everyone happy Thanksgiving and uh, hope you enjoy your break, whatever way you want to spend it. I'm gonna stay here if someone's willing to talk with me one-on-one -on -one or have some questions. If you want, please post a message in this chat so I know that I want you to, you know, uh, to move you into a one-on-one -on -one chat room. But otherwise, everyone else, thank you and have a nice long weekend and happy Thanksgiving.